I am so excited to have Mark here. He uh, He's an old friend um, and a very good friend of politics and prose. Uh, but apart from that, he would be here anyway. Um, he's here tonight for his new book, Citizens of the Green Room, Profiles in Courage and Self-Delusion. Uh, Mark is uh, a familiar face in Washington, but I feel like I should say in this town, actually. Um, he was a writer for the Washington Post for many years and currently is the chief national correspondent for the New York Times Magazine. Now, the last time Mark was here was a little over a year ago. Is that right? A little over? Yeah, 2013. I think it was in the summer. And it was shortly after the publication of his last book, which is called This Town, which is about this town. Um, it was a, I don't know if, how many of you had a chance to read it. It really was one of my favorite books of, of last year. Uh, it's very insightful, sort of tragic comic look at the games played by notable Washington insiders. And you may recall, if you paid any attention at the time, that... Um, there was a lot of buzz about the book. Uh, it did go on to become a New York Times bestseller. Uh, but when it came out, uh, there was both amusement and I would say a fair degree of consternation uh, in the chattering classes of Washington because Mark did not include in the book an index. And if you remember, there were all sorts of very important people in Washington who then actually had to read the book <laughs> to see if they were mentioned in it, which was very clever and I think again you know people didn't know whether they really wanted to be mentioned or was it a good thing or not to be in the index in any case I am very happy to report that citizens of the green room does have an index so um, all of those self-important people can find out whether they're actually in it without having to read the book but they should read the book um, it's Mark's third um, it's a collection of more than 20 profiles that uh, he's written over the years about a variety of public figures media types like Mike Allen of Politico, Chris Matthews, um, politicians from Hillary Clinton to John McCain, Chris Christie, Terry McAuliffe, uh, ancillary political figures, Teresa Hines, uh, and many others. And the pieces, I think, are, are really interesting uh, and because they're both fresh and refreshing, at least to me, and I read a lot of political stuff. And what I, what I find uh, really good about them is that you realize you think you know these public figures and actually you really don't once you read, read the piece. And uh, he has, I think, over time, and you talk about this a little bit in the book, kind of evolved in the way that you approach writing these profiles and learning about subjects and how to sort of listen and observe his subjects. And I think as a result, it's fair to say that, that Mark really has become a master of the political profile uh, he's someone who doesn't consign himself to the sort of safe and bland zones of artifice that uh, so many public figures construct around themselves to both control the narrative and conceal things about them that actually might explain them better and make them more sympathetic in the end. Uh, he finds clues and nuances in his subjects that offer greater insights into their characters and actions and daily existences. And I think, not surprisingly, quite a few of the pieces in this book, and surely uh, ones that you will go on to write, are now r widely regarded as uh, classics of the profile genre. All of that said, I am not suggesting that anybody in public life would actually want or hope to be profiled by you. Um, but if you read his work, you know that he can be simultaneously uh, very, very funny, very clever, uh, scathing at times, but also deeply compassionate. Uh, in fact, so much so that I really felt this reading, uh, this town and up going back and rereading some of these profiles. I'm not sure some of his subjects actually even realize they've been skewered. So that's truly a, a great art on your part. Um, if you've read the pieces already, I think it'll be fun to read them again. Um, some of them are, I think, what was the earliest one? 2002 or three? Yeah. 2002 or three. So it's so over about a dozen years. Um, and if you have not read them, you should start reading them now. It's really a terrific and fun collection. Uh, Mark, it's always great to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. Please join me in welcoming Mark Leibovich. Um, thank you so much, Lissa. This is, um, as I think I might be saying what I said last time, but I actually... I'm just going to, because I'm shorter, sorry. Thank you, yeah. Um, I'm taller. So, <laughs> uh, I love politics and prose. This is, this is the hometown bookstore. I was here yesterday. My kids um, have a place downstairs where they read books and where we buy them. And um, this, I will do anything for Lissa. I will do anything for this bookstore. Everyone should buy all their books here, and you don't need to hear this from me. So thank you for being here, and thank you for buying everything from politics and prose. Even groceries. Do you sell groceries? I guess you don't. No, that's, leave that to that other horrible company. Yes. Um, yeah, don't even bring your own bags. Pay for your bags. Um, a couple of things from uh, Liz's very generous introduction that I wanted to, to follow up on. 
one, the the lack of an index in this town was immediately subverted by the Washington Post on day one of publication <laughs> when they published an online index uh, of everyone, all these 752 people, entities, gods, deities, whatever, that were mentioned in this town were, were listed in alphabetical order in on the Washington Post. And that set off this sub freak out of Twitter people saying, hey, it says I'm on page 242. Can someone tweet me with what he said about me? Or if it's embarrassing, just direct message me with what he said about me. So um, this, of course, also went to prove the point of the book, which is that Washington um, you know, can be a home or a habitat to uh, people who are excessively full of themselves. But the other piece of this, and um, and, and this actually goes back to this town also, is I would get all of these follow-up notes from people, and some of them were not, I don't think, treated terribly well, or at least their ilk was not treated terribly well. And a former senator who I will not name, but I don't think he came off terribly well objectively in the book, and he wrote me this most incredibly wonderful letter thanking me for writing it and saying he hoped I would do a sequel and how it's important that this city, this town, look at itself honestly, periodically. And it was like an old mirror that, that shows us um, exactly who we are. And I remember forwarding this to David Rosenthal, who was my publisher, and he wrote back saying, it is remarkable. Everyone thinks this book is about someone else. <laughs> um, so in that vein, um, we have Citizens of the Green Room, which is a collection of profiles I've done over the years, and um, this is actually, this is, there's a profile of Chris Christie in here, and as it happens, I'm closing a profile of uh, Governor Christie that is running in this Sunday's Times Magazine, and I was working on that for a while. Uh, it took him a while to warm up to the idea of letting me hang around and actually talking to me, and finally he did, which usually happens for some reason. And at the beginning, I remember I had this off-the-record meeting with him at the beginning, and he said, uh, you know, I've heard a lot about your book. Uh, I haven't read it, but I've heard a lot about it. And then in our last meeting, he said, you know, I read your book, and uh, it was very amusing and very entertaining, but why does anyone talk to you? And I'm like, well, you tell me, Governor. Here we are sitting here. It's been three hours, you know. Um, and I do get that a fair amount, and um, I don't quite know why, but I, I do think that like Lissa said, hopefully I try to render people honestly, I try to keep an open mind, and, and I think that the essence of what we do as, as political writers and, and profile writers is to try to live somewhere between what the official story that people are trying to tell the world and what the real story is, and try to really subvert the many, many layers and zillions of dollars of imaging and messaging and bullshit that, sorry, our, our kid, I hope the kids are downstairs, that are, um, yeah, that really is what a lot of the political economy is built on, right? It's, it's the language of spin, it's the language of obsequiousness. And people have said to me, uh, after reading a number of my profiles and, and so forth, what, um, you know, you must be so cynical. And I say, well, yeah, I, plead guilty to that because, you know, when you're a reporter in D.C., you're spoken to in a certain way, and after a while it does wear you down. But I do like to think that in my case, and in a lot of people's cases, that the cynicism that does bubble up here is, um, is idealism turned inside out because you do have high expectations for the, the people in public life and, and hope that, um, you know, they can do better and, and we can aspire to better. So one of the things I, I wanted to talk about sort of at the outset is um, – Hillary Clinton is someone who I've written a fair amount over the years, and I was just talking to Lissa over in the, in the, I guess, I don't know if that's a green room, is that, was, it was the side office. Uh, by the way, they actually saw a picture of the, there was, a copy of the book was found in the Morning Joe green room the other day, which I took a picture of and I tweeted. So the layers of meta here are very, very, very <laughs> active. But um, Hillary Clinton, who has been as public life-ified as anyone I know, except for maybe her husband, uh, gave this speech back, I guess, in March. And she's obviously said this before, but I was struck by something she said, and she put it in the introduction. And I put it in the introduction. She didn't put this in the introduction. And um, she said, there is relentless scrutiny that now stalks not only people in politics, but people in all kinds of public arenas. And it gives you a sense of being kind of dehumanized. 
and I was struck by her word choices personally. Like I was sort of jarring to be hearing words like stalked and dehumanized. And she also went on later to say, uh, one of my, this is, um, you, you can't really ever feel like you're having just a normal day, Hillary Clinton said in her Portland speech. It can be done, but you never forget that you're in the public arena. And essentially what my beat has become and what this book is, it's a chronicle of public life. I mean, it's a bunch of discrete characters, but we do take for granted as journalists how unusual this is, how unnatural it is to have expectations that you're going to be covered, that you're going to be watched, that you're going to be scrutinized, that you're going to be pampered in a certain way. And I remember during the Hillary Clinton presidential campaign of 2008, there was one of these after hours, uh, you know, casual drinks that a bunch of reporters had with, with her and a couple of her staff people up in New Hampshire. And I remember the conversation lulled a little bit and I asked her, so uh, Senator, what, what's your favorite state other than New York? And she looked at me, she goes, I can't answer that. And I said, all right, what's your least favorite state? Because I always like to ask people just sort of goofy, random questions just to see what they answer. And she goes, I'm running for president. I can't answer that. And I said, you're right. You can't tell me that. And I remember like that at that moment, I was thinking, OK, it's a little strange because you cannot answer the most basic question. But I also remember four years earlier, um, sitting at a baseball game with John McCain for a profile. I was writing about him in, I guess, 2004. We were at um, the Phoenix Baseball Stadium. It was then called Bank One Ballpark. And we were watching the Arizona Diamondbacks play. And late in the game, I just sort of said, so, Senator, where would you least like to live? And he said, mm, Milwaukee. You know, you ever been to Milwaukee? And I'm like, well, yeah, I think so. It's not that bad. I don't know if I'd put the least favorite, least like to live place. And he goes, yeah, let's just put Milwaukee down. And I wasn't, I mean, this was late. We had spent a lot of time together and I think I had worn him down. And I sort of buried it. It was like at the end of a long piece. It was one of those things where I asked, uh, there was like a whole bunch of bullet points. I learned these things in the course of the game because I had extra space. And um, this was 2004. And sure enough, in 2008, Thanks to the Obama campaign, there was a whole series of ads in Wisconsin, then an important swing state, about how Senator McCain does not like your hometown. And he had no recollection of, of, um, of saying this. I had virtually no recollection of writing it until I started getting these calls from all these like, Milwaukee and Wisconsin uh, radio stations and TV stations about this outrage that I had um, reported on in 2004. And it does give you a window into how depressingly cautious one has to be about giving such a mundane opinion in a throwaway context. Now, John McCain is, had this iconic presidential campaign in 2000. This is this, remember the Straight Talk Express campaign where he was just, would talk for hours in the back of his bus in New Hampshire, and he almost upset then front runner uh, Governor Bush. And, you know, I think the, the, the press has always been pretty nostalgic for this campaign. And this was, as David Foster Wallace said, because he wrote this amazing piece for Rolling Stone about this campaign. He said, well, the amazing thing about John McCain is he really approximates what a, a, what a human being might actually kind of be like, <laughs> what a real human being might actually kind of be like. And it's true. I mean, it was a, a joyous campaign. And it was, and he, you know, like everyone, I mean, McCain had a shtick. He knew it. It was the real talk shtick. It was the straight talk shtick. And you, you see, though, that that evolves. And fast forward to 2008, John McCain had everything to lose. He was the Republican frontrunner. He was the Republican nominee. Uh, he had to put the straight jacket on. And not only that, the people who were then on the back of the bus laughing at his jokes were now people who had these little thing called Blackberries and iPhones who were tweeting things in real time about what he was saying. Um, and there was all kinds of reasons for him to just absolutely clam up and have a very, very detached and controlled and hopefully um, you know, escape that kind of scrutiny. So it does give you a window into how that world has evolved. And one of the things I wanted to do is read to you, a couple of themes have evolved in my early discussions talking about this. And one of the things about public life that you always, that you, you take for granted, I think, especially in Washington, but that is really, really telling after a while is how much of this is kabuki. How much of what we see on TV, what we see on the Senate floor, on the House floor, is 
people playing to a shtick, whether it's a partisan positioning, whether it's a kind of personality, whether it's giving the people what they want. Like I was just following Governor Christie around and he was always doing the rock'em sock'em thing. He was saying, you know, he was like, if anyone doesn't vote for Governor Scott here in Florida, wherever he was, you know, he was doing the bully thing because people thought it was sort of a funny shtick. But I remember um, I wrote about Senator McCain again last year and uh, I was sort of struck by you know, Mr. Straight Talk himself and how he sort of had given himself over to the kabuki. And I, I'm not going to read a lot, but I'll read you some short passages that sort of get to this. Um, when I walked into John McCain's office a week before Thanksgiving, he is not at all happy, and he seems to be enjoying it quite a bit. Uh, he was sampling none of the usual flavors of upset we tend to associate with the Arizona senator. Not the McCain, McCain is bitter or get off my yard varieties, not even the deeply troubled umbrage that politicians of all stripe love to assume. Here is a man instead who is gleefully seizing an opportunity for outrage. I am very angry, McCain says through a smiling grimace. He hands me a photocopied compilation of old quotes from the Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid from back when Democrats were in the minority and Republicans were threatening to enact a rule, the so-called nuclear option, that would require only a 51-vote majority to confirm most presidential and, judici and judicial nomination, most presidential and judicial nominations. Turns out Reid believed this was a bad idea when the Republicans were in charge, but a good one now, and McCain is packing bullet points. I'm going to kick the crap out of Harry Reid, he keeps announcing as we walk from his office to the Capitol. Once on the Senate floor, McCain approaches Reid, puts his hands on the majority leader's shoulders, smiles, and says something I can't make out from the visitor's gallery above. Reed smiles back, says a few words in reply, and places his hands on McCain's sides. It looks as if they are dancing. Minutes later, McCain stands to address the chamber. He, has, he is, as advertised, very, very unhappy. Today is a black chapter in the history of the Senate, he says, referencing another something that Reed said back in 2008 as a way of pointing out his hypocrisy. He then goes on to explain that this, quote, was as historic a vote as he can remember casting and that he now feels great, quote, sorrow for the harm done to the institution on this, quote, sad day. After McCain leaves the floor, I asked him what he said to Reed before his speech. I said, Harry, I'm going to kick the crap out of you. Then he said, John, I would expect nothing less. McCain grins to conclude this, to conclude this dark chapter in the history of the United States Senate. Um, and actually, a couple of, he then returned to his office and met a group of Australians, and this really has nothing to do with what I just read, except that I think it's funny. And it's only one paragraph. After his screed on the floor against Harry Reid, McCain hurries back to his office for a scheduled sit-down with a group of dignitaries from Australia. I love the Aussies, he declares to me outside his office door, then swings it open and is met with a face full of them. Sorry I'm late, he tells them. I was just on the floor kicking the crap out of the de Democratic leader. They all sit down, and McCain mentions the Congress's approval rating are now so, is now, re re approval ratings are now so low, we're down to paid staff and blood relatives. He drops this line so often, probably the only people on the planet who haven't heard it are in Australia. Everyone laughs, and McCain adds that he recently received a call from his 101-year-old mother, and she's not happy with Congress either. So we're now just down to paid staff, he says, to genuine belly laughs from the Australians. A few minutes later, McCain wants to talk about Fiji, the archipelago in the South Pacific, where he says he used to vacation with his family. They are lovely, gentle pe people, McCain says of the Fijians, even though they used to eat each other. Um, I don't know why, but that always makes me laugh. Um, so... Anyway, that's an example, though, of the shtick. And one thing that people in the public eye often take for granted, or at least people who don't know from the outside, is that the play acting that we see on TV is not often really the from the gut, authentic kind of emotion that we like to, that we often think it might be. Um, and one of the challenges of my job is actually finding pieces of these people who have been written about and covered to death that are fresh and illustrative and um, hopefully you know, entertaining for people to read. And I remember in 2008, one of the, one of the, the editors of the, the Washington bureau chief of the Times called me in and he said, we'd like you to write the Hillary Clinton biography pieces because we're going to do this whole series of biographical profiles of the people running for president. And I'm like, okay, great. I get the one who's been probably written about more than anyone else running combined. And I remember 
I then, you know, I, I graciously accepted. And then I read everything that had been written about her pretty much, which is a lot. And you realize that there is always room. First of all, people are always evolving. But you, you realize that people are written about in a kind of shorthand. And the shorthand leaves a lot of room for reporting through people's history, for reporting and talking to people who aren't normally spoken to. And I remember I was doing the first installment, and it was about her Wellesley years. And in the course of that, I found this guy who was this pen pal. Remember this guy who, who she grew up with? She, her name was John Pevoy. And they were pals in Park Ridge High School or whatever the high school was called. Maine, what is it? Maine South High School. Very good. It's so good to have Clinton's uh, ghostwriter here. Yeah, Sorry, am I allowed? Use, useless fact. Useless fact. Yeah, South Maine, Maine South High School yeah. in Park Ridge, Illinois. Was it actually in Park Ridge? I think so. Okay. Now I'm questioning whether that really was the name of it. But anyway. It's all right. Whatever. Pretend we'll pretend it. Anyway, uh, Hillary Rodham and John Pevoy went off to college, Hillary to Wellesley and John Pevoy to Princeton. And they just wrote letters back when people used to write letters. And... They wrote these long, expansive, revelatory, sort of raw, um, you know, sort of searching letters that you would, I imagine, write when you're in college. I mean, I probably did, and if someone ever found them, God forbid. However, I never ran for president, and I think hopefully they're all destroyed. Um, Hillary Clinton, so this guy is sitting out in California. She, he had not been in touch with, with Hillary Rodham Nay Clinton for decades, and he um, kept these letters in a box, and I found him, and I, I, I called him, and I figured immediately, like so many people in the expend, extended orbit of, of Bill and Hillary Clinton's life, that someone had gotten to them, and they had been um, either, you know, they're, they're going to be quiet, or they're going to, they've either been written about before. And there was this guy, and he just said, yeah, no, it was really interesting, and I'm a pack rat, and I kept them all, and I have them in a box somewhere. And um, I said, well, I'd love to see them. Do you mind if I see them? And this is when I get to thinking, okay, if I were in this guy's shoes and this reporter for the New York Times called me and he is calling out of the blue and he's asking to see, I would tell him not very nicely. I, I would just, all of my red flags would go up. Um, but luckily his did not. And, um, and that implies that I had bad intentions. I didn't. Now, I, I flew out to California. He allowed me to see them. He allowed me to Xerox them. And I remember flying back that day and getting this window into this person that I thought I had kind of known in a public space. And these were the most eloquent, vulnerable, almost you know, beautiful letters from a college girl from the ages, or from the years 2000, or 1965 to 1969. And I mean, smarter than I certainly was in college and probably smarter than most people are like as completely you know, fully formed adults. And just saying, you know, first of all, asking, where is this person? Now, I know that this person exists, but it was so foreign to the person that we have come to know over the last few decades of, of the Clinton years that um, I found it just beautiful. And, and it was probably that story got more response, feedback, uh, commentary than anyone, any story I'd ever done like to that point, and maybe ever. Um, and I remember Howard Wolfson, who was then Hillary's communications director on the campaign, I remember calling him the Saturday before the Sunday it ran, saying, Howard, uh, we have these letters, and um, you know, we're going to publish them. I just need to authenticate that you know, they actually, she wrote them. Because you know, Howard, at this point, could have said, um, no, she didn't write them. And I would have absolutely no leg to stand on. I mean, this guy could have been an imposter. We probably wouldn't have run the story. But Howard, to his credit, said, yeah, yeah, she, she, she said she wrote them. Um, and um, I said, so what did she think? He said, well, she's a little freaked out, but, you know, she's been through worse. So uh, I wanted to read, and which is probably, well, this is definitely true, um, but I wanted to read a few of them because th I will never, it was just a really amazing um, cache of letters, which I still read occasionally just when I'm trying to get a fresh look at her, look at her, and um, let's see. Is, uh, Bear with me here. You know, I had a post-it note. In fact, this was my post-it note, and I have ripped it out of here. <laughs> I'm not going to confirm. Oh, wait a minute. Here we go. 
They were high school friends from Park Ridge, Illinois, both high achievers headed east to college. John Pevoy was a bookish film buff bound for Princeton. Hillary Rodham, a driven, civic-minded Republican going off to Wellesley. They were not especially close, but they found each other smart and interesting and said they would try to keep in touch, which they did, exchanging dozens of letters between the late ni- summer of 1965 and the spring of 1969. Mrs. Rodham's 30 dispatches offer a rare, unfiltered look into the head and heart of a future first lady and senator and would-be president. Their private expressiveness contrasts with the ever-disciplined public or political persona that, that she now presents. Quote, since Christmas vacation, I've gone through three and a half metamorphoses, and I'm beginning to feel as though there's a smorgasbord of pers- personalities spread before me, Ms. Rodham wrote to Mr. Pevoy in April of 1967. So far, I've used alienated academic, involved pseudo-hippie, educational and social reformer, and one half of withdrawn s- simplicity. Befitting college students of any every era, or of any era, the letters are, are self-absorbed and revelatory. Missives from an unformed and vulnerable striver who had, in her own words, not yet reconciled myself to the fate of not being the star, unquote. Sunday was lethargic from the beginning as I wallowed in a morass of general and specific dislike and pity for most people, but me especially, Ms. Rodham reported in a letter postmarked October 3rd, 1967. In other letters, she would convey a mounting exasperation with her rigid conservative father and disdain for both, quote, debutante, dorm mates, and acid-dropping friends. She would issue a blanket condemnation of the, quote, boys she had met, who know a lot about self but nothing about man. Pretty deep. Um, And also tell of an encounter she had with a, quote, Dartmouth boy the previous weekend. It always seems as though I write to you when I've been thinking too much again, Ms. Rodham wrote in one of her first notes to Mr. Pevoy, postmark November 3rd. 15th, 1965. She later joked that she planned to keep his letters and make a million dollars when he became famous. Don't begrudge me my mercenary interest, she wrote. Of course, it was Hillary Rodham Clinton who became famous while Mr. Pevoy was, has lived out his life in contented obscurity as an English professor at Scripps College, a small women's school in Southern California, where he has taught since 1977. Um, and I go on to you know, quote from a whole bunch of other letters. But I remember when um, Hillary Clinton's, I guess, um, when her last book came out about her years as Secretary of State, she did an event, I guess, was it at GW? I think you moderated it, didn't you? Wait, this what? One, this there was one, no, it was this time. It was oh, her last, last book. Time. Yeah. Oh, 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 just last year? Yes. yes I did. And we Lissa there. moderated it. Yeah. I did not even mean to do this, but you moderated it, so it's like, it's a small world. But she talked about how she's sort of done with the um, the sort of scripted caution, you know, of of the Hillary persona that we knew. Now, whether that's possible, whether that's true, we'll never know. But I do think there is certainly an appetite in the population and for politi- among political consumers, and, and I think by the practitioners also, to maybe, um, if not get your guard down, you know, maybe have a realer kind of conversation um, between public figure and the citizenry in, in this world. So anyway, um, I hope you'll read this. It's, uh, the profiles are really fun. And I have found, again, in the early doing, in the early going here, uh, people have like all over the map reactions to it, but also questions about what they find interesting. So um, if anyone has questions, I would love to take them. And go up to a microphone. Thanks so much for coming. It, it feels weird speaking on the microphone when you're it's 20 okay. feet away. Yeah. Um, but your your profiles are excellent. Every Sunday is improved when there's one in the Times. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Since you are not running for president, maybe you can answer this question. Of all of the people that you've interviewed and, and profiled, who is your least favorite human being and who is your most favorite? <laughs> um, I guess really my, the only way to duck this question is to announce my candidacy for the president of the United, <laughs> of the United States um, tonight. Um, actually, I'm going to think about that for a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, um, I, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to fudge this answer. I'm not going to answer, I, I don't really have a least favorite, I don't think. Um, there are some people who are completely full of crap, but um, I, I would say that people ask me if I like politicians. 
uh, people get I, I get asked that all the time, and usually I do. Um, I have great respect for people who actually live this inhuman, dehumanized life because I think quite often it begins from a place of of idealism. And I'm totally ducking your question, aren't I? I I'm just going to say. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm extremely biased to people who I think are actually human beings and who are acting like human beings and whose guard is not as up as I think most people are predisposed to having their guard up. And, and look, maybe justifiably so. Um, it's funny. I mean, I, I've, um, I just, my last profile before Christie was of Mitt Romney, um, which is about a month ago or a month and a half ago. And he invited me up to um, spend some time with him in, in New Hampshire, he and Anne. And I have no idea why. Um, but he was, there, there was that little boomlet then where everyone was saying, Mitt Romney's going to run for president again. And the Republicans are hankering for him. And he was like very much an it girl again. And um, did I just call Mitt Romney an it girl? Put, put that in there. Um, but no, I mean, I remember just sort of seeing him and he seemed so completely relieved. He, he seemed like like 100 pounds lighter. And did anyone see that Netflix documentary, Mitt, um, about him? And, and I remember saying, you know, this is like a real, somewhat likable person. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a you know, he, he's a four-dimensional person in this, per, in this rendering. And how many zillions of dollars did he spend to image consultants and uh, to try to actually present himself as a, a palatable figure over two presidential campaigns that just failed miserably. And I don't know, I, I was so impressed just in sitting there with him at, you know, how how nice it is when someone doesn't have anything to lose. And, and he really did not seem to have that much to lose. And although, you know, I, I know he's a public person. I know everything he was saying was probably in some ways calculated, but it was, it was the departure from the public Mitt Romney that, I had gotten used to watching and in many ways gotten sick of watching for, for as many years as you know we all have. Um, it was amazing. And it does give you a sense of how refreshing it can be. So, and I liked him. I mean, I liked him. I absolutely liked the person who invited me up to spend a couple hours in New Hampshire, probably because he let me come up there to spend a couple hours with him. So. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Hi. Thank Hi. you so much for this town. I look forward to reading uh, this book. Thanks. Uh, question for you about uh, sort of the families of the um, people that you write about. Do you find that the sort of facade, you know, the um, the t like the families and spouses like Mary Pat or right. um, uh, Mrs. McCain, like they will speak in talking points as well, or even the kids, do you find when you're writing? Less so, less so. Now that's where you gotta be careful because they, especially with kids, I mean, um, you know, you don't want to take something that like, especially someone under 18 says and just sort of run with it because it's gonna tell you, you know, something, I mean, I give them a great deal. I cut them a great deal of slack. Um, but now, I mean, the first political profile I did, or the first one that person that was, I think, in here, was a profile of John Kerry. And I remember I just started work at the style section of the Post, and I remember reading all these great old profiles that people like, um, you know, back um, Marjorie Williams, who was one of my idols, who was just this great, great writer for the Post style section for many years. <clears throat> um, so many of the best pieces that she did had her subjects with their spouses or with their kids, and it's always a really great way of seeing someone. And I sort of innocently asked John Kerry if um, Miss, you know, Teresa Hines would would be willing to be interviewed jointly um, in one of these interviews, and he agreed and she agreed and, and they were all gung-ho because this is us and it was 2002 and the straight talk express had just had this very successful run and you know they were pals from you know they were vietnam veterans and he was going to let the world see him too and um the piece became pretty memorable because they were pretty unplugged and my tape recorder was plugged um actually it wasn't plugged but it was on um it sounded good right but um and you know they had this kind of, they were bickering and kind of arguing in front of me and I kind of had the tape running. And, and it was illustrative though, it was in a window into the two of them I'd never seen. Um, I mean, you could argue, did I really have to write about what was going on in front of me? I'm like, sure. So um, 
I mean, part of it was I, I don't. Uh, I, I have to. I have, after a while, you learn to listen to what surprises you, right? Um, I had this great editor named Steve Reese, who was my first editor on the style section of the Post, and I, I actually give him a series of shout outs in the introduction to this. And Steve always got me once I came back to the office to tell him what was interesting rather than what was obligatory, meaning what was what I what did I have to quote? What was the he said, she said, what was the on the other hand? I mean, so much political reporting is larded up with stuff that feels necessary, even though it's thoroughly unentertaining. Um, and I, I think being a good profile writer is learning how to trust what you find to be interesting and learning how to relay it in a way that is uh, relevant. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Hi. Hi, Mark. Um, Hi. I enjoyed uh, your first book, This Town. Um, and I'm sure I'm going to enjoy the next um, the, the next iteration, but I do have a concern, and that is that um, uh, this town and shows like Scandal and House of Cards play into this idea that everybody is corrupt and everybody's on the take and everybody's got an agenda and everybody um, uh, runs things through um, focus groups, etc. Um, the concern I have is that um, this is actually a very rich place as well for a public interest community. Mm. And people are drawn to Washington to do good work and to do important work, and they're not on the take. And they're not, um, you know, they meet with members of Congress, they don't have PACs. Uh, and I'm one of those people. And so I've gotten caught up in a few uh, situations myself. And as have some others of my friends who uh, there's an assumption that, you know, there's some ulterior motive always for what you're doing. Right. And so I do worry about this sort of poisoning the atmosphere with um, mm -hmm. the notion that, you know, everybody's got an agenda and nobody's for real. So I, you know, right. w been wanting to ask you that question. Yeah. And um, I'd love you to, uh, uh, you know. Yeah. To tell no, me what I, you think. I think it's a great question. I mean, I would say. Um, well, this town, I mean, I can't speak for House of Cards and, and, you know, any of those other shows, but it was not about the public interest community. I mean, it was about people who come to Washington, you know, often with the best of intentions, who, for whatever reason, over a great deal of, you know, time, become part of a community that sort of swallows them up. Um, a lot of them are people who serve in Congress, serve in the Senate. I mean... There is so much money in politics now, and the people who are s truly serving the public interest, who are actually doing the work that people like me are frankly not writing about, you know, and are are are, are people who probably should know better, but they are actually trading off of a public brand that I think has been enabled by this world that we have now, you know, created of, of new media, of money. Of celebrity and you know this town one of the misconceptions about this town is that it takes the entire city down I mean it takes a very very small slice of the city I guess you'd call it down I don't know but that gets a disproportionate amount of attention money power and um, look I, I I love a lot of the people that you're talking about they're my neighbors you know these are my friends and I think that you know I would love to write about them more, but maybe in a future book. It's not so. that interesting, though. <laughs> it's okay. Maybe not. Not. Yeah. Uh, but thanks. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, uh, listening to you uh, and your discussion about these politicians and the um, the cynicism. You know, I come from the Caribbean, and uh, mm -hmm. we have a saying in the Caribbean about uh, politics. It's the Dutch Caribbean, right? Mm -hmm. Politics being sushi. Politics being dirty, right? It's a popular, uh, sushi. Yeah. It's a it's a popular mental word, mm -hmm. um, and I think what the lady said is is well well taken. If politics is sushi, then you go to our islands and you see the consequence, right? Then it becomes corrupt. People people did say I want to have nothing to do with it, so you get corruption meeting corruption and marrying corruption, and then you have a real beautiful outcome at the end of the day. Having said that, some of the questions to you. Why do you believe we have this kind of acted politics, this, this play acting type of politics now? Do you believe that it's a direct consequence of the fact 
that in these uh, extreme right-wing conservative neoliberal times, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where a politician comes out and claims, you know, he's going to follow the cause, he's going to create jobs, he's going to clean up the environment, he's going to do something mm -hmm. about racism and sexism and whatever else, and then he does nothing. That at the end of the day, because of the way the system is functioning, uh, maybe the only thing left is a kind of a cynical play acting for the people in, in, in the system. Sure. Um, yeah. Because, you, you know, the, the problem of the mobil demobilization of the population, the, the, you know, the, the falling apart of all type of communities and stuff like that. Yeah. Do you believe that um, these are the bigger problems? Uh, or how do, you, how, how do you explain, uh, you know, the situation that, you, that you're facing? What, what type of explanations have you come up with in the meantime? Thank oh, you. okay. Um, explanations. Uh, well, I, I mean, I would say, look, I mean, the play acting piece of this, a lot of it is in response to, to television. I mean, I think... The the I mean uh, Mike McCurry who is the White House press secretary under I guess in Bill Clinton's second term or maybe he overlapped the election, but he he often says that the single biggest mistake he made when he was in the White House was allowing TV cameras in the White House briefing room because it created this permission structure and this incentive for people to basically act and play to the cameras and no I mean that's not I mean this is not specific to politics but. Um, look, I mean, I, I think the, the system is geared to people trying to exploit it and television and, and sort of messaging in a way that, that hopefully relays something to, to voters in a way that's, that's easy for them will be, um, will be rewarded. But I don't know. I mean, I, solutions, I, I, I will say that, that po politicians do tend to respond to self-interest. And I think we, we have seen certainly with, with President Obama's campaign in 2008, even with the Tea Party in 2010, is that grassroots movements can be very powerful. Um, you know, I don't think Republicans would be talking about immigration these days, and actually I don't think they are talking about immigration these days, but if they did talk about immigration like they were a couple of years ago, it would be because it was in their self-interest. So, um, you know, I, I think that, that this is part of an evolution. I think it's part of the larger culture and... Um, you know, I think that that's probably what explains this more than anything. So, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, hi. Good evening. I was struck this weekend by a, a NPR interview of Bill Cosby, mm. who was on for another purpose, was but was confronted with uh, the charges against him, the most recent charges, and right. and his response was not even to utter a word. Right. He didn't even want to validate it by making a sound. So there was absolutely nothing to report. Yeah. With that as a small case study. Could you speak to a couple of those individuals who have tried not to cooperate with you, have tried to avoid the glare that you yeah. represent, and how successful have some of them been, and unsuccessful, and what has that earned them, good or bad? It's a great question. I mean, I think in the case of Bill Cosby, I mean, they got him. I mean, he was in a radio studio, and I mean, the silence spoke volumes, and it was clear to everyone what was going on. I mean, it would have been even better if it were on camera, and you could see him just sitting there, but... Um, you know, once you've gotten someone in the studio, I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> you know, you can do a lot of, <clears throat> for lack of a better term, damage. But no, there, I've had people who have not cooperated um, with me, and um, I do one of two things. Sometimes I go away. I just don't do it. <laughs> um, I usually tell them I'm going to do it, and I often do do it. But I, I think you have to work extra hard. You you call people. You keep showing up because a lot of these public figures are, you know, they're public figures. They have public events. You sort of watch them and they see you and you pick stuff up. And I think if someone says, no, I'm not going to talk to you for this story, which happens, you know, fairly often. Um, and it's, you know, it's a perfectly legitimate strategic, you know, strategy, you know, thing for them to do. You, um, you, you, you learn to use different senses. It's like, you know, if you like don't have sight, you learn how to use your your touch or your ears better or something like that. I mean, I think uh, some of the best stories I've ever done have been just working really hard and calling, you know, that much many more people around them. And, and quite often, the more you work on this, the more it'll keep coming back to them. I mean, there are certain interviews you do with people who are close to the person and you just know that everything in that interview is gonna go back to the person immediately. So you sort of treat it like an audition and you sort of ask questions that you know are gonna be channeled to, to them directly. Um, I remember when I was writing about Glenn Beck, and his, the profile of him is in here, he wasn't participating at first. 
And I did these um, interviews with people who I knew he was really, really close to. And <clears throat> I was very earnest, and I asked very pretty easy questions, to be honest. And not because I knew I was going to get like any great value from these really easy questions, but I knew that it was going to go back to him, and, and he was going to probably take a message that, oh, well, this guy is really sympathetic, and I, I should definitely talk to him, and he's really working hard. So, I mean, there is this game of telephone that is being played, and I'm not sure the people know that, that this game is going on, but, uh, but there are a number of ways to wear people down. Usually they come around at the end. Um, and then what I'll sometimes say is, look, I mean, it'd be, it's fine if you don't participate, but at the very least, I'd like to fact check this stuff with you at the end. I'd like to come back to you after and talk about what I've learned. And the fact checking interview at the end quite often becomes the interview and they realize what you have and their guard is down because they're not trying to posture. They're just sort of, you're, they're kind of playing defense because they have made this decision previously that they're not going to you know, they're not going to talk. So you have, by gaining, you know, this information, you have gained the power dynamic in the, the, the you've got a much more powerful dynamic in, in the relationship. So, yeah. 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 Thanks so much for coming in. Um, I just yeah. have a question. Yeah, please. Um, I, I'm sort of fascinated by, you know, this story of the man, you know, he's living sort of his quiet life in California with his letters and that he never reached out to anyone and that you, you know, you got in touch with him and, you know, you thought maybe his first impulse would be to bury them or burn them or exploit them or, or something yeah. like that. And I was just wondering if you ever felt like when you were sort of pouring over these letters, and I agree that they seem, you know, really interesting and beautiful. Right. But I wonder if you ever felt like maybe Hillary Clinton had a right to, yeah, some some part of her life when she was that 20-year-old college student, you know, that yeah. she she wrote letters if you ever felt like i i do um and i would and that's what i, I would say is in, in a case like that you have a responsibility to i mean present it as such i mean do not like i, I would never write a story in which i said well this proves she's a socialist because in this letter she wrote in 1968 i mean i couched it in f exactly what it was which mm -hmm. is letters written by a vulnerable searching college student and I mean, this guy is really he's sweet he wasn't trying to exploit them I right. mean he was and you know was I playing on his naivete I don't, I don't think so I mean it actually felt like a very honest transaction and um, you know it, it was I think it becomes very subtle in that case you can I mean you could I'm sure there's any number of outlets that could take a couple of lines out of context and you know, have a field day with it, but um, you know, I think in that case, if, if you know she's running for president, and and there are all these you know letters written by by, I mean, I think she's a figure of history. I mean, I think I found it it was an extremely. Um, I, I didn't get grant her the zone of privacy, but I think that again, it's your responsibility responsibility to to sort of put it in context, and um, you know, I certainly came away from that story. I don't know if I'm liking her more, but certainly appreciating a, a fuller sense of her being. And I think most readers who would read that would probably do also. Right. Yeah. Also. Thank you. So. I think we're going to have time for one more question. I just want to make one, going to make one quick comment sure. um, in response to that question, which is uh, Mark and I were talking earlier. We had Ken Burns and Jeff Ward just on the Big Roosevelt uh, series on PBS for a lunch today. And we were talking to them about their definition of heroism. And if you have seen the uh, seen the film or, or uh, read their book, it's called the Roosevelt's an intimate history. And by intimate, they don't mean prurient. You know, they don't mean the sort of cottage industry that exists today to pry into people's lives and sort of reveal the escapades and the right. um, you know embarrassing and humiliating things about them. But really, what they what Ken Burns said is it's emotional archaeology that keeps. Uh, uh, that helps us remember that gr the greatest heroes are not at w at what he called bland perfectionists. Right. And I just wonder yeah, if exactly. what we're turning to now is we're creating sort of bland perfectionists as leaders because we go for the prurient, not the actual intimate way of understanding their paradoxes and contradictions. And I think, Connor, that's what you were you were getting at, too. But I don't mean to... No, it's true. What was the term? Bland, bland perfect? perfectionism. It's so true. I mean, Hillary Clinton herself used to use the line, I guess in 08, I'm sure she used it before, is I'm the world's famous, most famous person nobody knows, yeah. or whatever. And... Um, the best 
best known, least known person. The be world. Yeah, that's true. Which I imagine a lot of famous people would probably say about themselves. I think most people think they're fundamentally misunderstood. Like Christie went off on this big thing about how misunderstood he is. And, and like, um, <laughs> but a uh, little sneak preview. Um, but the uh, yeah, no, it's true. It's depressing. I think people fundamentally do want to be known, but I also don't know how you do it in this environment where there's just such madness and such anarchy in the peanut gallery and I mean the the the, the, the thoughtful take on someone is is absolutely I don't think I, I think it's much more the exception than the rule um, so I don't know I, I will say that um, we I, I, you know people I think journalists especially just have to keep doing their best and, and hopefully um, you know we'll get to a better place but I, I at the very least, uh, I hope you'll at least pick up. Uh, oh, I yeah. just thought I'd, uh, yeah. well, I just felt the, I, I have this feeling that things aren't quite as bad as we often feel like they are. I mean, right. people, even politicians are, as you're saying, basically trying to do the right thing, but we're forcing them not to. And and I think part of it is, well, the, the scrutiny that they get, as you're mm -hmm. mentioning. Right. I mean, it wasn't so long ago that a, a president that was hands off as far as reporting what they're doing. John Kennedy got away with, did things that the journalists knew what he was doing, with Marilyn sure. Monroe and other people. But it was a feeling that it, this would be a harm to the country to, to point out his flaws and that if people lost their faith in the president, our country would be weakened. And uh, yeah, and so there was that feeling that... Uh, we're better off not knowing. I, I think so. I mean, I wouldn't let everyone off the... I wouldn't say that it's all about scrutiny per se. I just remember my takeaway from that Roosevelt thing, just the, the brief bit that I watched was just how, how higher... how the stakes were so much higher and how everyone was in... I mean, all the Roosevelt... Teddy and Franklin Roosevelt had, like, what? Between them, like, 12 sons who were enlisted... I mean, people were enlisted. I mean, there was a sense that the country was like, there was like, talk about existential crisis. I mean, pe people were, were really scared about the fate of the country and they were invested and, and the country was absolutely, I mean, it, the, the silliness that we're talking about now really, I mean, it, it's sort of like the political equivalent of a first world problem. I mean, here we are talking about, right. um, oh, scrutiny and everything. Yeah. I mean, we, we do have it really, really, really decadently. I mean, you can argue all kinds of things about what it says about the fate of the nation. But, um, I mean, we have, like, I guess this luxury to be discussing all this. And I don't know. I, I don't know where it's going to lead. But I, I, I agree, though. I think that the focus on the puerile and, and the very small um, can probably add up uh, in a very, very you know, destructive way after t a long time. So. Thank you all for coming. We have books up at the front. Mm. Mark will be happy to sign. And if you yeah, thank you.